Uh, so, uh, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Martin. Kevin is a partner at Goodwin Proctor. Any co-ops? Any future co-ops? Oh, okay, good. At Goodwin Proctor. Joe, make sure you come up and say hi to Kevin. <laughs> say nice things. Thanks, man. So, uh, so, uh, so, Kevin grew up in the Boston area, went to Georgetown, which happens to be the same place that Justice Scalia went to college, although I don't think you overlap. I think he had better grades than I did. Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, Kevin went to Columbia Law School, clerked for uh, Judge Silverman on the D.C. Circuit, and that was in 99, and then clerked for Justice Scalia in the October term of 2000. And you've been at Goodwin for a Since while. Then. For a while. Yeah. Right. And you... Uh, do litigation, but also head their appellate practice, which includes representing clients in front of uh, appellate courts to the Supreme Court. Right, right. So, uh, I was planning to, to have Kevin come anyway, but of course this is especially timely, <coughs> given what happened in February, but the other aspect of Kevin's background that is interesting and relevant is that he also has argued cases in front of Judge Garland. So in that regard, we can both talk about Justice Scalia's legacy, but also about the person that's been nominated as, ex as the successor. So I think what we'll do is just uh, start a little bit. Maybe you could talk about your uh, clerkship experiences, but even step it back at one level, because we have a lot of aspiring law students. Talk about why you went to law school what you enjoyed about law school and advice that you could provide, and then we'll talk about what happened after law school. Sure. Um, so, so there's, you can do lots of different things with a law degree. Uh, most lawyers at big law firms these days don't litigate their corporate lawyers, and they're working on, on contracts, uh, negotiating deals, they're doing environmental compliance work, and just giving people advice. Uh, but I went to law school because at a, at a certain point in college, I realized I just really liked arguing with people. And it, I figured out you could get paid to argue with people if you went to law school. Um, that's, that's my day job now. I actually hate arguing in my personal life. And if my kids want to fight with me about something, I'm like, Dad's home from work with no argument. Um, but, you know, that's, that's definitely one, one thing you can do with a, with a law degree. And if you do, if you enjoy um, that process of, of trying to marshal arguments and, and take your arguments and put them up against the other side's best arguments, and to see who prevails, uh, law school is a is a good place to go. It's sort of like competitive sports for nerds. Uh, so that, that's my pitch for, for the litigation world. And there's nothing there's nothing more satisfying than, than you know working on a case for two or three years and then having a, a judge say that you're assigned. I mean, it's usually they're happy. Um, if they if they lose, I'm not so happy, and then you have to fight about the bill. But we're on video, so I'm not going to talk about that too much. Um, Clerking, so I, I went to law school. Uh, when I when I went to law school, I wasn't I, I was sort of convinced that I wanted to be a litigator, but I, I did have in mind maybe doing corporate work as well. Uh, law school is kind of strange. You the summer after your first year of law school apply for internships with law firms. Uh, and most likely the place you go after you have two semesters of grades is the place you'll wind up going when you graduate two years later. And then most likely you spend several years of your, your career, not your entire career. Uh, so I, I uh, went through that process, applied for different jobs, wound up um, in Hong Kong doing corporate work, uh, which was I, which cemented my, my my thought that I'd rather be in the U.S. doing litigation, arguing with people. Uh, and then uh, toward the end of my second year, I started applying for clerkships. And so, uh, as Dan mentioned, I got a clerkship on the, on the D.C. Circuit, which is uh, the court where Judge Garland uh, is is sitting now. And so overlapped with him briefly there. He, he was brand new to the court. The older justices kind of referred to him as the new kid. <laughs> he's, he's now, I think, the oldest person to be nominated for a Supreme Court position in at least decades. This yeah. yeah. Um, so, so saw him there. Uh, then interviewed for a clerkship on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, I wound up getting one with uh, Justice Scalia. Uh, was there for the 2000-2001 period, uh, which was a, it was a, um, it was a very contentious period. We had Bush versus Gore that year, uh, which kind of riled things up a little bit. 
And uh, after that, everything was actually a little bit sleepy for the rest of the year. Um, and then I left there in 2001, moved up to Boston, um, where my wife wanted to. I grew up in Massachusetts anyways, but my wife wanted to go to grad school here, so we moved up uh, where we went to grad school, and then just wound up uh, settling here ultimately. Uh, since we moved back home, I had a kids, my parents weren't about to let me leave. Um, and so we've been here ever since. Great. So maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit, uh, sort of the DC circuit, you know, their docket, and you know, what, what those two clerkship experiences were like, and how the justice, who I believe are pretty, or the judges who are pretty good friends, I think Silverman and Scalia, now we knew each other, right? Yeah, the good so ones. tell me about that, <coughs> those two experiences, and then also the, you know, the interviews. Sure. The, um, so they, you know, the U.S. Is a, is a federal system, right? So you have states, and the states have lots of authority over certain subjects, a little less than they used to. Uh, then you have the federal system. And the federal appeal court, appeals court system is divided up mostly into regional um, <laughs> regional courts. So the, United, the Massachusetts and most of New England are in what's called the First Circuit, which is based here in Boston. Uh, there are 11 of those regional courts. Uh, you also have two uh, courts, which are sort of specialized federal appellate courts. There is the Federal Circuit, uh, which deals uh, mostly these days with patent cases. Uh, but also it's sort of this very strange combination of patent cases and federal employees who have employment disputes. And you have the same set of judges dealing with those two very specialized areas of the law. The uh, DC Circuit, uh, where I clerked and where uh, Judge Garland was a judge and where Justice Ginsburg was a judge and Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas and Justice Roberts, so, so many of the justices in the US Supreme Court come out of this DC Circuit, which has a focus on federal agencies. Um, and so when you have uh, challenges to uh, regulations. The Environmental Protection Agency wants to uh, put some kind of regulation in place, or the FDA wants to ban a drug. Uh, most likely, that challenge would be brought before the, the DC Circuit. And so the judges there develop an awful lot of experience uh, just with the, the inner workings of the federal government, with federal statutes, with uh, constitutional challenges to, um, to federal statutes, which will wind up making up a, a fair percentage of what uh, they wind up doing if they get elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court. That's great. So it's, it's sort good, of a good training. It's, a, it's like the AAA team for the U.S. Supreme Court in some ways. Right, and as right, and as President Obama said in his remarks, right, often considered uh, the second most important court in the land. Yeah, and they, and they wind up with very high quality judges. D.C. is a great legal market, and so people tend to work for big firms there, get appointed to the D.C. Circuit, and then go on uh, from there. And it probably doesn't hurt them though if they're sort of part of the social path, right? You're going to event and practical Yeah, if you're at a tech party with the existing system, sure. Yeah. That really helps. And those are and those are once a month. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 so you clerk for Judge Silverman and then and then did, did you find out that you were that you had an interview during the, the DC third clerkship or even before them? I know sometimes they really Yeah, during law school. Um, everything's um, getting pushed out these days. Yeah. So when I was at the U.S. Supreme Court, it was a, a lot of uh, 25 to 26-year-olds uh, who had gone straight from college to law school, straight from law school to clerking at a circuit court, straight from a circuit court to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, nowadays, it seems like people tend to take a couple of years off before they go to law school, uh, which is something I actually think I'd recommend. That would be get some real, get some real, unless you know that the law is for you, uh, get some real world experience before you invest an awful lot of money in a law degree. Um, and then people tend to, after they go to law school, take some time off before clerking. So the average age of everything is, is creeping up. Right, so they're really wise, they're 28, they're 29. Oh yeah. Deciding the fate of our country. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so, so, what, so what was it like? So his clerks first, his clerks first put you through with, I think, with a, with a sort of harder breathing ritual, with harder questions, and then you had to adjust it. Right? Yeah, so, um, and I think it's similar for most of the justices when they interview, and, and judges at lower courts <coughs> too. If you ever wind up applying for a clerkship at a federal district court or a uh, court of appeals, usually they'll have their clerks put you through a, a murder, almost a murder board, right? Um, and they'll ask you questions for an hour or two to gauge whether you actually, uh, whether the grades you're getting in law school actually reflect your ability to uh, think on your feet. Uh, then usually the judge or justice will just try to make sure they get along with you, and so they'll ask more softball questions. Um, and, I, and I think I remember you mentioning that uh, for Justice Scalia, you had to be ready to talk about a case that he wrote that you disagreed with. 
Right. And so, yeah, he always asks, what, what case did I get wrong? And he's not a very opinionated guy, so he's willing to listen to <laughs> that. But he, although, although he himself uh, had one case that he identified as the case that he thought he got wrong, uh, which I'm now forgetting. But think, organ, you know, the organ the case. Case. No, I don't think it was that. I, I'm blanking on it. Right. Um, but I think Justice Thomas mentioned that in the video, too. About how oh, Scalia mentioning a terrible case, and Justice Thomas said, oh, you wrote that. <laughs> so, right. So. Yeah, he also forgot sometimes what cases he wrote. Um, now, I, I picked a, a somewhat obscure case involving the liability of federal defense contractors when the equipment they build to U.S. Defense Department specifications breaks. Um, do you have a federal contractor defense to a state tort contract? <coughs> Um, which I thought he got, got wrong, but um, that, that should not affect most of your lives unless you're in a helicopter, which goes down someplace. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and then, yeah, maybe a little bit about the, the, the chambers, the functioning, and then we will get to maybe his larger effect and approach to the law. Um, yeah, so the, the, way, uh, the way the court works, and this is true, I think, for, for most justices, you, you have four, four clerks helping out each justice. And so the, the work of the chambers would be divided up somewhat accurately among the, the four clerks. The biggest responsibility that we had um, was to go through what's called this, this, the cert rule. Every year, something like 12,000 petitions come into the U.S. Supreme Court, people asking the court to hear a case that was decided against them, either at a state Supreme Court or at one of the federal courts of appeals. Of those 12,000 some odd cases, the Supreme Court will agree to hear something like 75. And so the task of winnowing down the 12,000 to the 75 falls in the first instance on the clerks, who have to read all the papers uh, below. So if you, if you think there are 36 clerks, we each read something like 350 of these uh, cert petitions, plus all the papers that were filed below, plus we look at the cases that were cited in the cert petition. So that was a lot of work to try and figure out whether there actually is anything there when somebody says, hey, this is an important uh, issue, U.S. Supreme Court, uh, you, should, you should take it up. Uh, a lot of them, I mean, sometimes they were obvious. I had one person who claimed that aliens were controlling the U.S. government um, and had, had caused some misfortune in their family. What was wrong with that? Uh, it just, it, it, was, it was contrary to what I already knew to be the case from watching Terminator. Uh, right. Because you cannot send the clothed aliens back through time, where she claimed to have been excited then. But that's, that's the work that starts, you, uh, you get there in July. That's, so before the case of an argument, right? Immediately. The search, right, the search every, 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 every day, a cart gets rolled into your office and just drops off giant stacks of paper. And you start going through them. Um, then each person would be responsible for, if you divide up the 75 by four people, like ni 19 or 20 cases that actually are being heard by the court. Um, and so there, what you wind up doing is, is, again, reading through all the papers, reading through all the briefs, and then coming up with a recommended uh, outcome for the justice. Now, Justice Scalia was great. He limited us just to two single-spaced uh, uh, pages of background material that we could give him uh, as, a, as what's called a bench memo for him to review. Now, he would review all the briefs himself, too, but he only wanted to hear from us for two single-spaced pages. Uh, Justice O'Connor, who was sitting at the time, would be disappointed if she didn't get at least 50 pages, and so her clerks worked somewhat longer hours than we did. <laughs> so, then, so then, you know, there's, there's oral argument, and you sit there and you watch uh, as the justices grill people. Uh, and then after the argument, the justices go off, and they have a conclave, and the white smoke is issued, and they come out, and they, they announce to the clerks how the decision uh, will come out, and who's, who's, more importantly, who's writing, and whether they think they're going to dissent or not. And that's when the drafting process starts. And so, again, we would do a first draft of opinions uh, for Justice Scalia. Other people would do first drafts for their justices. Um, once again, Justice Scalia was pretty good. He put uh, soft page limits on us in terms of how much we could write. Um, and then he, would, then he would take whatever we gave him, usually uh, mark it up until it was unrecognizable from what we put over. And uh, then it would go up. Well, that's interesting, though, because he, had, he really had such a distinct writing style. And I guess the question is, when did you become more like him, right? At what point during that clerkship were you speaking to Yeah, right? if, if, you could, if you could get something quirky into the opinion that would then be picked up by the press as sort of a Scalia, a Scaliaism, uh, that was the high point of, of the clerkship. <laughs> <laughs> I then unfortunately carried that over with me when I started working at a law firm. And people would say, Kevin, you're not a justice anymore. 
can't just say whatever you want. I didn't know you were, didn't know you were a justice. Yeah, we, we have to write a little more respectfully. And and then yeah, maybe uh, just a little bit about about his approach, and we can sort of move his legacy, right? So uh, maybe you could capture textualism, originalism, his larger effect on sure. the law and on the on the court and the country. I mean the the real. If you if you take yourself back to the to the 1970s and early 1980s and look at how look look at typical Supreme Court decisions from that era, uh, there was an awful lot of discussion, not so much of of the way things were, but more of the way things should be, uh, and so it was it was a little more freeform. You had justices deciding you had, you had the sort of the birth of, of substantive due process, uh, and the notion that that the court could take a, a phrase which is essentially meaningless. Um, and turn it into a tool for uh, affecting social change across a whole number of areas. Um, and, the, and the phrase, I guess, would be liberty, the, the liberty clause. The liberty, the liberty, the liberty. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> um, but that's not really what they plan to do, right? Um, so, um, right. so ju Justice Scalia's main point was that the, the Constitution is fundamentally an anti-democratic document. Uh, whatever, whatever, the, whenever the Supreme Court strikes a law down, that means that some majority of people, or legislators, whether they're at the federal level or in some state, uh, decided that they wanted the law to be a certain way, and that the Supreme Court said, no, you, can't, you cannot have your way on this. There's this document, this pre-existing document, which says no. And so a, a current Democratic majority is, is being stymied in what they would like to do. Um, now, that's OK, right? You can do that sometimes. Uh, because the Constitution obviously does say certain things are okay or are not. Like there's a confrontation clause. You have the right to confront your witnesses. Um, you, can, you can walk through all the different elements of the, the Bill of Rights. You can walk through the um, procedural requirements of the underlying Constitution itself. And there are ways things should be. Um, that, the reason why that's okay is that it's clear that at some point in the past, you had a, a Democratic majority or supermajority. Um, who, you know, you had what, two, two thirds of the Congress and, and three, three quarters of the states, of the states right. um, who said, this is the way we think things should be, and we, we actually intend to bind the hands of our descendants so that unless they pass an amendment to the Constitution, they cannot change this. Um, we, think it, we think the right to confront your accusers is so important, no future Democratic majority can get away with it. Only a future Democratic supermajority can do away with that. If, if the Supreme Court takes liberties with the text and interprets the text in a way that no one could point back and say, yes, there was a prior, when, when people were enacting this part of the Constitution, they actually understood themselves to be binding the hands of some future democratic majority, then the Supreme Court has made a fundamentally anti-democratic choice. It has, um, despite uh, you know, any, any evidence of a supermajority saying, this issue's off the table, said this, is, this issue's off the table, and has struck down a law. And so that's, that, that is the fundamental um, underpinning behind originalism, which says, what did people actually think they were doing when they enacted this language? Um, textualism, which is sort of an offshoot of that, um, although that also applies to statutes. It, it, it applies to his approach to statutory interpretation. No legislative history. No legislative history. Let's look at what Congress actually said in the statute, not what Senator so-and-so may have said in some floor speech, uh, because we don't know that the rest of Congress actually agreed with what that particular senator said in the floor speech. Um, so it, it, it fundamentally would, would leave more issues open to current Democratic majorities to decide uh, than the opposite approach, which asks not what do people think when they were enacting this language in the Constitution, um, but really leaves it up to five, five justices on the Supreme Court to decide how they think things sh should be in their own mind. Um, now often the argument is made in support of that more freeform approach to constitutional interpretation, that it allows the Constitution to evolve. Um, but really, it, it, it has a more stultifying effect, because if, if, if society is evolving, then people can pass laws and, and change the laws democratically, or the laws can be changed at the state level. Uh, when the Supreme Court, though, steps in and, and five justices say, no, this is how things are, then they, they've cut off the bait. And at that point, things stop evolving unless you have five justices in the future decide to overturn the Supreme Court's own precedent, which they're really not supposed to do. So the other point is it doesn't necessarily have to evolve in one direction. 
it could be in different directions. It, it could evolve in, in different directions. So, you know, when, if you look at Justice Scalia, a lot of his decisions obviously were of a more conservative bent, but many are what people would consider to be liberal, especially in the criminal defense area. Uh, over the years, many people have said, well, wouldn't it be great if we could uh, have not juries, but judges uh, decide certain issues which weigh into sentencing criminal defendants? It's much more effective that way. And Scalia would point to the uh, confrontation clause, or you know, the confrontation clause, the right to jury clause, and say, no, you know, juries are supposed to decide all the facts which go into sentencing people, even if it would be more effective to have uh, judges do it. Uh, confrontation clause, and there's a period where um, people would say, well, certain categories of witnesses are too sensitive, they should not be put in front of the defendant, so the defendant uh, does not have the right to confront their accuser. Um, but the Supreme Court, again, said, no, you know, have a right to confront your accuser. And this is an area where Justice Scalia actually wound up on the more liberal side of the divide, and some of the more liberal justices wound up on the other side, um, because they believed that you know, things had evolved and people should make allowances for certain types of uh, witnesses, I think the line, usually children. So. Right, I think the line was, is the hero in certain, certain areas. Right. You, you had to wonder if you had a criminal background or something. <laughs> Crime of passion. Um, so what? What about? So so then maybe we could we could sort of talk about his um, his legacy on the court, and then uh, you know what you know what it was like to uh, be part of the process that honored him and moved down there and everything. But what you know, a lot of people said his actual influence maybe will be felt uh, outside of the court to a greater degree, and then you know, the study law and talk about law. And he was often a dissenter on the court, but that his ideas on the law of the legacy. <coughs> I mean, if you look at if you look at, for example, the way Justice Thomas and Justice Alito approach deciding cases to a lesser extent Justice Roberts, um, you, you can see that influence of, of Justice Scalia and the, the, the again the notion that you look you look sort of only at what people were thinking at the time they enacted the law, what what principles and uh, were they really putting in place? Uh, and that obviously is a is a is a approach to constitutional interpretation, which has been picked up by many lower court judges and is taught by uh, by some professors of law schools, say most professors of law schools. Um, and so it's just had a real a real influence in, in the law. Uh, in terms of his, of his funeral, uh, yeah, I went down on. So they they, they had they had a. There was a lot of uncertainty at first about when things would be happening. Uh, so he died on Saturday. Uh, I think it was only Wednesday night when they finally settled on on what day certain things would occur and what the role of the clerks would be. And so it, I learned for the first time there was a tradition that clerks would stand uh, vigil next to the, the justice's casket at the U.S. Supreme Court. And so uh, we, we broke up into groups of four during the day when it was open to the public, and then two overnight. I wound up with an early morning shift on Saturday, and so I just stood there for half an hour uh, guarding, the, uh, guarding the casket at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, there was a period where uh, President uh, Obama and, um, and Michelle Obama came, and they locked us all in a conference room. Actually, the Secret Service came and herded us all into a conference room, locked us away for 45 minutes while they locked away. Maybe you get the threat. Well, the Scalia clerks were in there. <laughs> 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 a lot of the Ginsburg clerks. So, you know, he, um, he, he was a, obviously a controversial figure. Um, within the Supreme Court and among his colleagues, uh, he was very well liked. Uh, you know, it, it's sort of, it, it's very well known that he and Justice Ginsburg were, were good friends, despite their very uh, distinct views on, on constitutional issues and no doubt political issues as well. Uh, you know, he, he, he would charm the reporters who would then write stories about him that were less than positive stories. Uh, he, in, in person, he was just a very likable guy. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's but, but he was getting up there, and a lot of the justices are. And so unfortunately, this is a scene that will be seen repeated probably several times in the next uh, few years. It, it's, it's rare for a justice to pass away while they're still sitting on the court. Uh, a lot of justices recognize that the time is coming. Um, and so wind up stepping down. I think Justice Scalia may have been, um, may have felt himself in some ways stuck there, 
uh, because we have eight years of the Obama administration, and so assumed he'd be replaced uh, by somebody who would vote uh, differently than he would vote on many of these issues. Um, I'm not sure that he would have been thrilled with President Trump uh, replacing him. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, and then may maybe you can just offer your thoughts on sort of where we are in this unique moment in American politics. <coughs> where someone I'm not sure I can talk about Garland too. Actually. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, Justice Garland's actually a good judge. Uh, I argued before him uh, two or three years ago in a case where we represented a nuclear power plant. So not not a bete noir of the, of the. I'm sure I'm using that phrase incorrectly, but I wanted to use a fancy sounding phrase. Hey, you're, you're at a university. Yeah. So so you, you might not think that a liberal judge would love a nuclear power plant. Um, on the other side of, of the V, we had the state of Vermont, which at the time had a Democratic governor. We had a group, a, a set of environmental uh, groups on the other side who we were up against, and they were trying to shut this nuclear power plant in Vermont down. Um, Justice Garland, you know, did not come after us. Uh, he, you know, he asked good questions on both sides, but his toughest questions were for the Democratic Attorney General of, of Vermont and for the environmental groups. Uh, who made what is considered a, a cardinal mistake in the D.C. Circuit, which has to hear these administrative cases all the time, which is that they made arguments for the first time at the appeals court that they had not made before the agency, before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and that you know, Justice Garland was not going to allow even people who maybe, or maybe not, he agreed with politically to get away with that, and ultimately we wound up winning the case. Um, and so I, you know, I suspect that Justice Garland would, would be a, a good uh, justice. Uh, at the same time, I also suspect that when you get to those five to four type decisions, you probably would wind up coming out uh, on the other side of where Justice Scalia would have come out. So you, you can, you know, of the 75 <coughs> cases in the Supreme Court here, it's probably 50 of them are 9-0. Uh, those, are, those are in some ways the easy cases, and some others might be 8-1 to one or 7-2. Uh, but on that set of, of 10, 5 to 4 cases each year, uh, a Justice Garland would, would wind up flipping what would have been a victory side Justice Scalia was on to a victory for the other side. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's not surprising that uh, Republican senators are looking for procedural means to, to hold up the nomination. Um, my own view on that is that the Constitution says nothing about, um, this is sort of the Bible, right? I mean, the, the Constitution says nothing about how the Senate has to work. There's no time limit on how quickly the Senate has to act on uh, approving or, or disapproving. A nomination to any court, or, or what advice and consent means. Right, and there's and there's Supreme Court decisions saying, yeah, the, the, the political branches, Congress, so the House of Representatives, and the Senate, um, can set their own rules. We're not going to interfere with, with that. And so, if the Senate wants to, sometimes people will say the Constitution requires the Senate to act. That that's simply not the case. I think the Washington Post looked at this and gave it four Pinocchios, and it's just there, there's no there's no rule the Senate has to act. I mean, should they act? Um, that's been, and then my next question is, how do you think Justice Scalia would have viewed? I, I think he would have said the senators can do whatever they want, and then voters will decide who they're more angry at. Mm -hmm. Whether they're more angry at the Republican senators for uh, putting up a roadblock, or they don't like the president's choice and think he should have let the next president decide. I'm not sure it'll matter that much to most voters. I mean, there are much more important issues um, confronting the country than, than who's sitting on the Supreme Court. Um, but it is an important issue, and I'm sure it is. <laughs> Uh, for some voters. If you look back at, at history and look at some of the statements, there, there was a, I was on a, on a news show where someone asked, whether the host asked, you know, do you think, of a, of the liberal person on the panel, uh, do you think that the Democrats would act the same way I, if it was a Republican president in this situation? And I think if you look back at statements made by Biden, Schumer, during the final years, we Harry Reid, Harry Reid, right. um, they, they probably would. Uh, ideally, the Supreme Court would have nine members, and whoever is president during year end would get up there, up there, term, second term, would get to pick who's on there, and the court would function with nine people. Uh, in some ways, it doesn't matter too much because of that. If you go back to that point I made before about there being 10,000 cases and they only take 75, uh, it's not like every important case winds up going up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And if there's a delay in the year in the U.S. Supreme Court considering an issue while they get somebody else on the court, it, it, at the end of the day, they make that decision with nine people all the time just to let something uh, in Supreme Court parlance percolate among the lower courts in the states a little longer. So it's, it's, not, it's not the end of the world. 
but uh, you know, Justice Garland seems like a great guy. Right? Uh, I hope someday you can get on. Um, but I guess I would get it if you're if you're in the prediction business. What do you think happened up until the election? Uh, so I think up until the election, nothing happens. Right. And then when Hillary Clinton beats Donald Trump by 30 points, uh, the Republican senators decide that Justice Garland is probably the best they're ever going to get, and so they they approve him sometime in December. Yeah, which is a nominee possibility. But, but after 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 hyping Garland so much, they have right. time. He, he could die while. Um, at <laughs> right, you never know. You, never know. you just don't know. Okay, so <laughs> on that note, so uh, like I think it's a good time to open it up for questions uh, people have. The other thing that I think Kevin can talk about also is sort of working on a case, uh, writing uh, amicus briefs. Uh, for those of you that are uh, familiar with those ACLU cases that recently challenged panhandling statutes in uh, Worcester and Lowell. Uh, Kevin was actually the lead attorney on those two, so maybe we'll have him talk about them as well. But before then, I just want to open it up if people have questions, comments, or observations. Professor Pollock. Well, thank you for coming to campus uh, and sharing your thoughts. How forthcoming was your thoughts and the interactions with the other with his colleagues on the bench during the conferences, but during those sessions in which the folks were not talking. Did you ever say in a moment of weakness that uh, such and such is just a hard headed nickel food for What about the, how, how forthcoming was Scalia to, the, to his clerks about his interactions with the others during the discussions of the cert petition, then the discussions of the patient himself? Um. You know, so the discussions themselves were confidential among the justices, and he actually wouldn't tell us what, what was said by him. You, you, would, you would know what the vote was, uh, but he wouldn't come back and say, here's the blow by blow of what was said, and here's my view of this person. Um, when you were clerking for Scalia, um, and you were helping him write his dissents or his opinions, did he ever bring up his personal beliefs of his religion or you know his conservative values, or did he keep it very legal and close I, to his? Or like with her, like with her formal line between. Yeah. The <clears throat> um, no, it was it was very legal. Uh, he he would want to know what the what the precedent was. Uh, now he had been there for so much for so long. Even by the time I was there, uh, he was in his mid sixties. That, and, and we had had the opportunity to see so much of his writings. That we sort of knew already what his views were. We wouldn't kind of have to have those those kind of basic discussions. Uh, but he would never he would never say, um, except maybe in Fourth Amendment cases where sometimes he would say, you know, like I could imagine or could you imagine being that that uh, person who's having the government go through your stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but that was more <coughs> just in the nature of, of sometimes pushing back on his clerks who were uh, sometimes more conservative. I don't know if this is something you can familiar with, but um, in terms of like what's the role of Justice Scalia's future works, you know, the people who work to be on oh, yeah. those yeah. poor souls. Right, like, I'm just what are they? You know, yeah, what are they going to do? So, so I don't even know how they're going to start I mean, obviously you hear the news, but like. So if we had a President Romney right now, then and President Romney had a Republican Senate, and they wound up approving uh, uh, pick then most likely that person would agree to take on Justice Scalia's incoming clerks. Um, I don't know that if uh, Garland is appointed that he would agree to take on Scalia's clerks. He very well may, um, but I'm just not sure. It's, just, it's a tough position to be in. They have the office. They don't have the place to work. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, in, in, in the past when somebody has resigned, so you get an offer in October of 2005, in 2006, uh, a justice announces they're resigning. They're supposed to be showing up there in a few weeks, although I did. Um, usually, the, the incoming justice agrees to take those people on, but usually, when someone resigns, it's because they know they'll be replaced by somebody who's got similar views. So, right, and Robert had, had done that for Rehnquist. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Could you speak to your time as an ADA and how that helped shape your legal career? Oh, sure. Um, 
So within Massachusetts, a lot of the big law firms have an arrangement with the Middlesex County, <coughs> Suffolk County uh, DA's office, where they'll send uh, litigators out to do a six-month stint, um, a secondment uh, with the DA's office to try cases. Uh, I thought it was it was great because I was terrified of public speaking, um, to be honest. And so for um, I mean, think about it. You're in. I was in college. I was in law school. I was clerking. My my job for you know for many years was just to sit there read and write in a library. Um, I didn't actually talk all that much. And so and so it was, it was good to stand up in front of in front of a judge in front of a jury uh, every single day for six months and have to engage with people. Um, so it, it, was, it was it was great in that way. And uh, I, I, I was at first I was just doing awesome. I had. I think six or seven, of my, my six or seven first jury trials, I won them all. And I thought, wow, I'm just, I should be a trial lawyer. I'm just really good at this. I then lost the next nine in a row. Sure. <laughs> and then it was time for me to go back to the firm. I kind of slumped back. Um, well, maybe I'll follow up with, yeah, going yeah. back to the library. <laughs> uh, did it change any of your views? Yeah, maybe on, yeah, on the criminal justice system, like things that you hadn't thought about before? No, no. But it did teach me how to do a field sobriety test. And so now I can test myself out before I start that, before you hit the road. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a question um, regarding um, Justice Thomas and the fact that you know he spoke out loud and asked questions um, very recently oh, sure. at um, you know, one of the first times that he was there at the state um, that you know, had, had passed. And um, if you could comment on, on that and what you think um, even Justice Scalia would think of that and the fact that, you know, Thomas did not speak really in his presence. And, and if, what do you think the likelihood is that, you know, is, will his voice continue to be heard and louder um, in replacing um, Scalia? I mean, ju Justice, is, Justice Thomas's view, which is not incorrect, is that by the time a case gets to oral argument at the U.S. Supreme Court, the issues had better be crystallized in the papers. And if, and if they're not, something's very wrong. Because usually, uh, by the time the Supreme Court agrees to take a case, it has been heard by several federal courts of appeal or state Supreme Courts. Uh, the court won't even usually consider a case unless they have uh, you know, multiple state courts and federal courts on one side of the issue and multiple state and federal courts on the other side of the issue. And so there's just a naughty problem that has to be resolved by the Supreme Court uh, to, to clean up the mess that the lower courts are making of things. Uh, so you, 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 and then you wind up getting usually very good lawyers um, to write the briefs. You have you know, amicus briefs on both sides of the issue, so you have not only the actual litigants, but law professors and uh, business groups and public interest groups uh, weighing in and giving even more information. And so you, you have all this in front of you. Uh, and you know, you, usually, uh, as a clerk, you can usually tell which way the case is going to come out before a single question has been asked at a little argument. And I, and I find this a practicing lawyer, too. I mean, usually you can, you might be surprised by the questions because you don't know how, the, how those judges are going to, to decide the case. Um, but it, 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 there's seldom an issue which was not the <coughs> sort of writing process, which comes out for the first time at argument. Uh, one of the things I, I didn't know, actually, uh, but it came out a lot during remembrances of Justice Scalia, was that before Scalia arrived in the court, apparently almost nobody asked any questions. Uh, there might be a few questions asked, but usually the lawyers would ramble on for 30 minutes uh, and sit, sit down. Maybe someone would ask one clarifying question. Uh, and Justice Scalia really changed that. So Justice Thomas, in some ways, is more a historical throwback uh, than some kind of anomaly. And also, as, as a practicing lawyer, I, I appreciate being given a chance to talk, not getting <laughs> in, interrupted all the time. Um, you know, and, and two, if you look at what's being said, and, and Justice Scalia was, uh, would do this, Justice Breyer is the worst of this. Um, I love Justice Breyer, he's a great guy. Um, but if you actually listen to what he's asking in this question, he's never actually asking a question. He gives a two minute speech um, saying what his view is, and then just kind of says, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's how he saved, right, so the, the attorney who Justice Thomas asked, I think, nine or ten straight questions. Justice Breyer popped in yeah. and said, well, that isn't before the court, right? Yeah. And, and when Justice Breyer is asking these really long questions, he's not even looking at the lawyer. He's looking out at the, at the audience. <laughs> he's playing to the crowd. Yeah. It's, it's one of the reasons why Justice Scalia was against uh, having cameras in the courtroom, because he thought it would just encourage more of that kind of thing. <laughs> um, 
Um, Justice Ginsburg has said that liberals who criticize Scalia should look at his cases regarding the Fourth Amendment because she considers him, or he is considered um, one of the most pro Fourth Amendment justices that was on the court. And I was wondering what your opinion on that is. No, I think that's right. Um, if, if you look, if you look at Justice Scalia's uh, jurisprudence, uh, obviously there are a lot of issues on which his, his decisions came out of the conservative way. Um, but there are also an awful lot where he moves on the, you know, you would think the more liberal side of, of the issue. Um, the Fourth Amendment is a great example of that. And criminal, de criminal defense rights generally, the Fourth Amendment, um, Sixth Amendment, uh, the, you know, anything having to do with juries, Justice Scalia, um, <coughs> the defendant's camp. Um, but even beyond that, so uh, for example, there's a, a doctrine uh, called the BMW versus Gore or State Farm Doctrine, in which involving punitive damages. And so this is something which is very important to the business community. Uh, you know, are there constitutional limits on the amount of damages, punitive damages that can be imposed against big corporations in cases, usually tort cases, brought by people who were hurt by a product? Um, you have a very interesting breakdown in the court there. Uh, you would think that the conservative justices would all support constitutional limits on damages for big business. But Justice Scalia thought that was an abomination. Uh, basically, his, his basic position, going back to what I was saying before, is that the Constitution says nothing about this. And if you look back at the historical record, there's no evidence that when, uh, that when the Due Process Clause was passed, enacted, people thought they were putting limits on the ability of juries to punish uh, people with punitive damages awards. Uh, another area is the Dormant Commerce Clause, which involves the ability of states to regulate uh, businesses uh, that engage in interstate commerce. Again, you would think that um, a, a conservative justice would be all in favor of limits on the ability of states to regulate uh, big businesses that cross state lines. Uh, justice Scalia, too, thought that was a, a complete, com complete nonsense. Uh, there was nothing in the Commerce Clause, uh, which is a limit on uh, or empowerment of the federal government which put limits, corresponding limits, on state governments to regulate businesses, which we have here. And uh, that was an area where uh, oftentimes when justices disagree with the majority, they'll eventually give up and say, OK, fine. I've, I've, been, I've been on the, the losing side of this issue for 22 years now, and so I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to go along with the majority. Uh, but that, during the Commerce Clause and limits on punitive damages are areas where Justice Scalia, until the end, said, this is, this is nonsense. And so it was very contrary to his own probably political beliefs. I would mean, like a um, bad interpretation of what like, we shouldn't even be handling this topic because it's not real, because it's not in the Constitution. Um, what would you say his view of a lack of constitutional amendments is? Like that so much jurisprudence is being forwarded, but there's no political response kind of validating it, that really those things could be changed um, no. in, the, in the congressional arena, but they're not being changed. I don't know what he would say, um, but I would, I would point this out, I guess, and maybe this is what he would say, that if you look, if you look back over history, there were a lot more constitutional amendments before people realized they could more or less get their way at the U.S. Supreme Court, which is a much easier path. Um, if you want to get a, let's say you're an interest group and you want to get a cap on punitive damages put into the Constitution, uh, under the Constitution itself and the amendment process, you have, to, you have to convince a large majority of your senators and representatives, plus three quarters of the states, to, to do that. Uh, if you just go to the U.S. Supreme Court, and you know, it, and the, the fifth, the, the swing vote is feeling in your favor that day, then you've convinced five people and you've won. So um, I, I think part of the problem and why people just ignore that that process is that there's it, it, there's no need to do it in a sense. Do you know what arrangements uh, Justice Scalia made for his papers? Has there been a, a biography that's been authorized to yeah. give his papers to the Library of Congress or the law school? So apparently, um, I, I understand just from reading in the press that he did not make arrangements for his papers. And so his papers, therefore, become the property of his family. Um, and his family could use them in the fireplace if they want to. Um, or, or they could come over. It's really up to them. Uh, uh, a lot of justices will. Um, will make arrangements. Again, they've, they've resigned before they, uh, before they pass away. Um, so, and usually they, they put these very long um, periods of, of lack of public access on the documents. So I think Justice Souter may have said, my papers will be available 50 years after I die. Or it might even have been everyone I served with. Uh, 
was def it was definitely, oh, yeah. and part of that was because we heard of Marshall's paper in the early 90s. Some stir. So, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned you clerked during Bush v. Gore, and a lot of the public recollections of uh, that term talk about how contentious it was among the different clerks of different justices. I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you lost your lunch. <coughs> but it was, it was contentious. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, yeah. There was a, there was a, a tradition that each set of each justice would go out to lunch with each set of clerks, um, and there were there was one justice who would, who would not go out to lunch with us, um, Scalia clerks after after that case. So it was a little, whereas we had a charming lunch with Justice Breyer. <laughs> Uh, were there any cases where, like, well, you mentioned you worked uh, as a clerk during Bush v. Gore. Were there any cases where, like, you yourself thought that uh, this definitely isn't an instance of him exercising judicial restraint? Or that I guess the public thought that in Bush v. Gore, um, maybe he was instilling a little bit more of his political views? Yeah. Um, I, mean, I, I would disagree with that uh, as to that particular case. If you look at the at the two decisions, that, there were actually two Bush versus Gore decisions, right? Uh, the first one was, was nine to zero to vacate the Florida Supreme Court and send it back down. Um, and then the second case, you had seven seven justices actually say uh, that what the Florida Supreme Court decided to do uh, was unconstitutional. And then they broke down those seven broke down five who said it's now December, this has to end, and two who said based on their interpretation of Florida law and time on place by Florida law <coughs> on uh, getting their electors certified. And then two justices who said, no, let's have a, um, let's have an additional recount if that's what Florida wants. So, um, you know, there, there was a clear consensus on the court that what was happening in Florida should not be happening. The only question was, what do we do about it? Uh, the, the, the case where I, I still, I look back at it, and I think, how did it come out this way, uh, was the case I mentioned before involving the, the military contractors. <laughs> Um, because it, it, it was clearly, if Justice Scalia's view is courts should not be legislating, we should let legislators, let legislatures deal with issues in the first instance. This was a case where the Supreme Court looked, saw nothing in federal law which provided immunity to federal defense contractors uh, when the designs they were required to implement uh, by, by DOD uh, wound up being defective designs. Yet nonetheless said, this would be a really good idea to have immunity for um, federal Contractors, and so they created this immunity as a matter of federal common law. Um, and federal common law, in my view, should be um, anathema. So, uh, that, yeah, in fact, that, so that's the case. I told Justice Scalia he, he screwed up. I can't remember if he agreed with that, actually. In retrospect, that, that was a long time ago. Yeah. So, maybe you can just chat uh, about two things. One of them is the amicus brief writing. The process, and then also about some of your work, some of your pro bono work, including the handling uh, ordinance. Sure. So, um, is everyone here familiar with what an amicus brief is? Uh, so, by the time a case gets up to the U.S. Supreme Court, it may be that of the many cases throughout the country dealing with that particular issue, the Supreme Court reached out and plucked one to hear. Uh, nonetheless, all the other people who have cases like that are interested in the outcome. And so usually through trade groups or public interest groups, uh, you know, whether it's the Chambers of Commerce or the ACLU, uh, or you know, pick whatever industry you want, the, you know, the Idaho Potato Growers Association, uh, they'll say, we really want to weigh in. Let the Supreme Court know what we have to say about this particular topic. And so they'll, they'll get a law firm uh, to work with them and come up with an amicus brief. Now, the Supreme Court hates getting repetitive amicus briefs. And I remember when I was clerking, you'd have a stack of 90 amicus briefs. And you'd say, come on, what, what are these people all really saying differently? And if you open it up and it just starts talking about the very same cases and legal issues that the parties have already briefed, um, you might just flip through it real fast so you can say you've looked at it and put it aside. Um, what the Supreme Court really wants to know is something that it's not hearing from the parties. And so while the parties may be focused on the precise meaning of the words in such and such federal statute, Potato <laughs> Subsidy Act of 2013. Um, the Supreme Court wants to know, you know, what are the real world implications of this act? Uh, you know, if, if we're not that they're particularly relevant, but some of that information may wind up coming into an opinion. 
um, you know, is there is there some issue here that the parties haven't briefed that that uh, we should really be taking into account? And so, amicus briefs can serve a very valuable function. In that, you know, what are the broader implications of this? If we rule against this party in this case, are there two thousand other parties who will be affected? Um, so, it's, yeah, they, they, they serve a valuable function. That's probably I mean, the, the seventy-five parties will each file one brief, plus a reply brief. So that's a couple hundred briefs filed by the actual parties. There are thousands of amicus. And so when you're an appellate lawyer, much of what you do is actually the amicus briefs and not the, not the party you briefs. You don't have that many fights in the apples, but I don't know cases where you're the yeah. proper party. And right. so, so as a clerk, did your, did, did your experience as a clerk influence the way you write them as an attorney? Um, yes, although I think at this point it's well known that you need to not just simply be repetitive of the parties. And so if, if you're a repeat player in the business of writing amicus briefs, you already take that into um, but every now and then you'll see an amicus brief written by someone who's not a repeat player. Uh, you might have somebody who does not go out and get a law firm. Instead, they write the brief themselves, and then they submit it. And uh, usually it's a little hard to follow. That's what it is. And, and, and oh, the, the ACLU cases. Sure. So, yeah. um, so as, a, as, a, as a sort of following in line with, with Justice Scalia oftentimes winding up on issues, on the side of issues you may not expect. Um, there, there might be five lawyers in Massachusetts who self-identify as a Republican or a conservative by the time one. Um, and so one day I'm sitting in my office, and one of my partners walks in and says, hey, Kevin, I've got a case. It's the ACLU. Uh, do you want to work with And I said, well, well, what's the issue? And he was already walking out of my office. came <laughs> back. <laughs> and said, well, they're, they want to challenge laws, the law in Worcester, uh, that, that bans panhandling, uh, bans people standing outside asking for money on the sidewalk. Um, now, personally, you know, I find it annoying to be asked by people for money on the sidewalk, especially if I'm with my family walking you know, in Boston or sometimes in other, like Worcester or other cities. Um, but as a matter of the First Amendment, I, I think it's absolutely clear they have every right to do that, as annoying as, as that might be, maybe. Um, and so I said, sure, I'd love to work with the ACLU on that. And so we, I wound up, uh, we wound up putting together a team of, of attorneys at Goodwin. Uh, we, we first sued in, Wor in Worcester. Um, and the judge in Worcester said, these people are incredibly annoying. And I think it's okay for a city to, to ban speech on public sidewalks. If it's maybe not just merely annoying, but if it's like super annoying, then that's okay. <laughs> and I'm only paraphrasing his decision slightly. <laughs> it, it then went up to the, the First Circuit. Um, here in Boston, and Justice Souter, since he retired um, a while ago, has been sitting in retirement on the First Circuit. It's sort of a perk for justices to keep them separate. You, you, like, you, know, you can play Yahtzee, or you can sit and hear cases. <laughs> Justice Souter sits and hears cases. And so Justice Souter is, is a renowned recluse. Uh, when the Supreme Court was not actually sitting, he would usually go home uh, to New Hampshire. He hated Washington, D.C. He hated hanging out with people in Washington, D.C. He just wanted to be home. And so when we saw him, uh, the people with whom I was working said, well, this is great. We have this former liberal Supreme Court justice. Um, we're probably going to win. And I said, oh, we're doomed. Okay, we're absolutely doomed. And so uh, Justice Souter wrote the opinion um, affirming the district court's decision, again saying, and I paraphrase only slightly, if speech is super annoying, then the government can get it, um, which was just crazy. And so we wound up filing a cert petition to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court vacated the lower court decision, um, sent it back, vacated the first circuit decision, sent it back down um, for reconsideration in the wake of uh, Reed versus Gilbert. Um, and then when it went back down, at that point, we assembled a factual record before we were looking for a preliminary injunction. Um, by the time the case came back down from the U.S. Supreme Court, we'd gone through what's called discovery. We deposed people, we collected documents, and all that. And we wound up uh, con now convincing the district court judge that as annoying as the speech was, uh, nonetheless it had to be allowed. And so we won there. The city didn't even bother not trying to appeal it at that point. Uh, and we won similar cases working with the ACLU in Maine, uh, striking down a law that Portland had enacted that was an anti panhandling law. Uh, we struck down a similar law in Cole. We have a case, after all these cases in cold, snowy New England, we've got a similar case in Tampa, Florida. Uh, which I'm really hoping will be 
waiting to a seven month trial. <laughs> not hopeful. Um, we're waiting for a decision out of that court. But it's, so, but it, but it's, been, but it's been great because it, uh, we got probably, we have around 150 litigation attorneys in our Boston office, and probably 50 of them wound up working on a series of cases in some degree or another. Uh, people across the political spectrum, uh, you know, all, all of whom agree that, that the First Amendment is, is inviolate and it's important that people be allowed to engage in annoying speech on public sidewalks, whether it's you know uh, panhandlers or uh, Occupy Wall Street people or Tea Party people. Uh, th there's someone who annoys all of us, and they all have a right to be out there um, speaking because they, they may change someone's mind about something, and that's the whole purpose of a free speech in the first place. Are there any other questions? Great. Thank you so much for your time.